I believe in energy, I believe in inspiration because inspired in spirit, the opposite of that is kind of dead, right? So I certainly, <laughs> I believe in being inspired, but I'm a strategist at my yes. core. And, you know, you're, if you're inspired and you run east looking for a sunset, I don't give a damn how enthusiastic you are, how positive you are, it's not gonna happen. Right. So I'm a strategist first, but I really do believe that people have gotta look at their life and say, as much as I want great strategy, I need a great philosophy of my life that's gonna make me fulfilled. Right. If you're fulfilled, like you said, you mentioned earlier, if you were with your friends and you guys weren't succeeding, but you're having a damn good time with this camaraderie, it's still worthwhile. And you can find a way to succeed eventually. But what the hell is success? It's hitting an expectation. And I always tell people, man, trade your expectations for appreciation and it's a whole new world instantly. Yeah. If you can appreciate this moment, if you can't find ecstasy in this moment, in a conversation with a friend and looking in your wife's eyes, being with your children, going on a run, a if you can't find XC now, I'm here to tell you, more money, more people, more love, more business, more anything is not going to give you more XC. Right. You got, if you can't do it here now, you're not going to do it there when you got more. Yeah. So why not do it now and, and have a rich life right now? I tell people, money, that's one thing. Like having financial abundance, there's skills. That's a science. But wealth, it's a decision. It's like you can be wealthy right now. I, I live in Fiji a good portion of the time. There are these villagers there. They're the richest people I know. They're happy, they laugh, they love, they don't give a damn about the economics. Other people say they're poor. When I first went there, I was trying to do things for them. They're like, what are you talking about? I'm so happy. <laughs> Wealthy people come over from the United States and they go travel around and try to figure out what to do and they're gonna spend nine you know, years to do this and this and this so they can finally sit down and be happy. And the Fijian right. guy goes, why don't you sit on the beach right now, dude, and experience <laughs> it? Why spend the nine years? Why not have it now? That's my invitation. The fastest way to fulfillment is to feel like the work you do matters. At the end of the day, everybody is built to serve. I wrote a whole book on it. You are built to serve. You want to feel like today matters, that you're going to wake up and you're going to create something today that will mean something to some people, to someone. Maybe it's a million people. Maybe it's one person, but you're going to make something that will mean something to somebody. Look at me. I'm sitting here in a parking lot. My wife is shopping at a food store and I'm sitting here in the car with my, my, my dogs passing out <laughs> on my phone, making a video. Why? Because I feel like this matters. I feel like somebody's gonna watch this video and it'll, it'll make a difference for them. And hopefully that's you. Maybe not everybody, but at least one person will watch this video and it'll matter and it'll mean something and it'll make a difference. And when I feel that, I'm much more likely to show up. I have more fulfillment, I have more energy, I have more kindness, I have more love, I have more motivation. And when we feel like what we're going to do doesn't matter, makes no difference, nobody cares if we show up or not, that's the path down to anxiety and stress and overwhelm and depression and suicide. This is where most people are at. Most people do not like their lives. Most people feel like what they do does not matter. I think most people wake up and they drop their job that they hate. And they feel like today it doesn't matter. Nobody cares if I show up or not. The work I'm doing doesn't really have an impact. And that's why a lot of people move towards entrepreneurship is because we're looking for more fulfillment because we want to feel like this thing we're going to do is going to make an impact in at least somebody's life. And if you can run some of those things together, you can have a couple of days even in a row feeling like this matters. Hey, the energy difference that, that will be inside you, the motivation will change, the kindness will change, how you show up for others will change, how you talk to yourself will change, all because you feel like the work you're doing today matters. They did functional MRIs on people's brains, and I talk about this in Built to Serve. They did functional MRIs on people's brains to see what parts of the brain light up when we're helping people, when we feel like we're gonna do something that's even just a small act of kindness. And it lights up the same part of the brain as having food and having sex, serving others. It's the same part of the brain as having food and having sex. We're hardwired to do it. If you're not happy right now, it's because you feel like you're not serving, that you don't matter. You might be doing stuff that matters, but you feel like it doesn't matter. This is where I get stuck on goals. People say, well, what are your next goals? I don't know, 5 million subscribers, 10 million subscribers. It doesn't, it doesn't mean anything. What does that mean? It's more the qualitative stuff that means the most to me. It's the comments that you guys leave on the videos. It's the people that come up to me at events and, and tell me how much the content has had an impact on their lives. Like that's the juice. That's why we do what we do. And of course you have to get numbers and of course you have to drive revenue. And of course you have to like all of that matters because in making money, it allows you to go and create more and serve more and help more. 
you know, and build a better life for yourself as well. Um, money is definitely important. It's got to be in your top five, but it can't be number one. And number one is feeling that you're on a mission and that you're going to make something today that will matter. So how do we do it? Again, I go through the process and build the serve, but basically three steps. It's who I have. So who is your single most important core value? And if you get to guess, what is your most important core value? What do you stand for as a human being? For me, it's belief. So I want to spread belief everywhere that I go. In this video, my intention is spread belief. I want, I want to believe more in myself, and I am hoping that you believe more in yourself as a result of being around the stuff that I make. I don't always accomplish it, but it's the intention. It's the goal always going in. And whatever your most important core value is, that's what you still need more for yourself. It's your biggest roadblock right now. And it's also the gift that you want to give to the world, to the people around you. You want to help them feel X as well. So for me, it's believe, what is it for you? Step two is your why, and your why is your purpose, and your purpose comes from your pain. So whatever you struggled the most with is the thing you want to help other people through. So I struggled so much as an entrepreneur, a young entrepreneur, a 19-year-old Evan, quit on my business partner, didn't think I was adding any value, no contribution, not getting any results, working my face off, but just getting zero results, no traction. And I hated it. I hated it. So I quit on my business partner. Um, I went back the next day, but that was, that was, man, the worst day of my life. And my why is to help other entrepreneurs not struggle as much as I did. Whatever you struggled with the most is a gift because you're going to help other people not struggle as much as you did. And that will make you feel amazing forever. We all love helping, right? Back to the functional MRIs. You love helping. You love assisting. You, you'll, you'll buy the coffee for the person behind you in line or you'll open the door for somebody or you'll help somebody pack their car with groceries or help somebody up uh, who fell on the street or something. Like you'll, you'll do that. It'll, it'll feel good. Um, but that's a little momentary thing versus if you felt like there's somebody who you're helping who was a younger version of you, you see you in that person and you help them come alive you, by talking to you, by spending five minutes with you, you see hope light up in their eyes that, wow, maybe I don't have to stay stuck. Maybe I don't have to struggle and suffer as much as I am because they met you. Man, that's a totally different vibe and feeling. That's the, that's the thing to get addicted to. Get addicted to serving, get addicted to helping, get, a, get addicted to impacting, you know? What a difference it makes. And so figuring out your why becomes really important because we'll often, uh, just find ways to try to find any kind of meaning without ever ever having done the deepest work. And as entrepreneurs, we struggle to often looking back. I don't want to think about my most painful moment. That was in the past. I don't want to touch that. I want to be happy and optimistic and move forward. Well, this is how you do it, right? The point of looking back at your most painful moment is not to live there. It's to say there's lots of people who right now currently are struggling with the thing that you struggled with before. And you can help them and you'll you'll light up it'll be the greatest thing of all time to help those people so first is your who your most important core value second is your why which is your purpose and the third is then your how and that's that's your passion so how do you want to help people so how so i want to help people believe in themselves and especially entrepreneurs because that's where that's where i struggled the most but how do i do it well however you came out of the hole that you were in is a teachable thing that you can give to other people so for me, it was modeling success. And that's it. Who has done this before? And I studied them and I applied that lesson. It was Bill Gates. I applied his lesson to my business and we started having success. Now, what have I done for the past 20 years is teach people how they can model success to the situations in their business or their life to accomplish their goals. So how did you get out of the hole that you were in? What was the thing that you did? And where we get trapped a lot is we love helping people to get the result but we don't love the process of helping them. So the classic example I use, if you're moving your, your, your office, I love helping you as an entrepreneur move to a new office, but I don't want to help you pack boxes and pack up computers, right? So I like the end result of helping you believe in yourself and you've launched your new office. Awesome. But I don't like the process that leads up to it. So we're constantly chasing the result, but we don't enjoy the process with the number one rule for success is you have to enjoy the process. And so we get, givers, we get trapped in this loop of constantly helping people because we love helping people. We feel good helping people and we get the result of helping people, but we don't enjoy the process. And so we never get actually great at the thing or world class because we're not enjoying the day to day work. 
And so that becomes the next challenge is however you got out of the hole that you were in is a teachable thing to others. And we have to enjoy the process of doing it so it doesn't feel like work, right? That whole expression of find what you love and you'll never work a day in your life. It's true. You know, I, I, I love making videos. How have I done so many videos for so long so consistently? Because it doesn't feel like work. This isn't this isn't work. I would, you know, my wife is in, in this store here, you know, shopping for, for food. That feels more like work than sitting here in the car and making a video for you guys, <laughs> right? And so there's no right or wrong, you know, for, for my wife, she'd probably rather be in there than making videos. So for you, what's the process that you actually enjoy that is contributing to other people? So when you can combine all those things, when you can find the thing you love doing, that's a service to others, that is helping people who currently are who you used to be and in injecting them with the core value that you've got that you still need even more for yourself, that's when everything starts to shift. So the who, why, how process. Who, your single most important core value. Why, your purpose, your purpose comes to your pain. And how is your passion. How you actually want to help people with their, you know, through your who and, and your why. You figure that out, everything gets easier. Everything gets more exciting. Everything gets happier. Everything, you feel more grateful, more confident, more alive, more momentum. You start making more money. It's, it's like you're, you stop fighting the world and you start flowing with it because you want to serve and you've got so much kindness and opportunity inside you that needs to come out that where you are right now is not is not where you want to be it's not where if you fast forward a year two years five years you want to be in a better spot everything wise health wise emotional gratitude money in your bank account all of it and it's and it's possible when you can connect your who your why and your how to find the fulfillment that you're after. Also, to make sure you're actually taking action after watching this video, I've designed a special free worksheet just for this video. The worksheet will highlight all of the lessons learned in this video, as well as pull out our three favorite learnings and quotes that will inspire you to actually do something. The worksheet will also give you space to write down what your key takeaways are and your specific plan of action to make sure you're getting results. If you want the worksheet designed specifically for this video, absolutely for free, there's a link in the description below. Go click on it and start building the momentum in your life and your business. I'll see you there. Here's what I've created for my life and anyone I know succeeded. I'm a 17 year old kid from Azusa, California, with no real education other than self-education, with no background, with parents that did their best, all of them, with no money, but I did one thing, I loved people, and I had an enormous demand I made upon myself, and I sculpted my mind and my emotions to get me to do whatever it would take to achieve and to contribute. But to do that, I did it by using my body and changing my focus. I did it by putting myself in a peak physiology and using what I call incantations. Can you train yourself to believe something, yes or no? Absolutely. How many of you have ever made the fatal mistake of going to Disneyland or Disney World, and while you're there made the fatal mistake of going to a ride called It's a Small World After All? What happens for about a week after you're out of that damn place? You're still singing this thing in your head in 24 languages, right? Well, let me tell you something. How many of you have things when you want to go achieve them and this part of your voice goes, oh, it's not going to happen or forget it? How many got a voice that sometimes interrupts that good pattern? Say, I. And what you want to do is train a new one. So starting when I was 17, I started doing incantations, not affirmations. Affirmation, you go, I'm happy, I'm happy, I'm happy, I'm happy, I'm happy. What's the problem? You haven't changed your what? Your what? Physiology. If you don't change your physiology, you won't get anything. So an incantation is not only you speak it, but you embody what you're saying with all the intensity you can. And you do it with enough repetitions that it sticks in your head. Like it's a small world, now the conversation in your head is always the same and it gives you what you want. So you use your body and your voice. So 17 years ago, I started doing things. I was working for Jim Rohn, this speaker. And I was 17 years old. I had long hair, minestrone soup, acne on my face. And I was trying to call on Bear Stearns type of people and convince them why they should go to this man's seminar and be more successful. I was driving a 1968 Volkswagen that I had earned at $40 a week as a janitor. The only way I did it was park far from the building 
and then go in and I love people and I believe when I put myself in state and I was able to influence people that were far more successful than I was at the time. I would do something that I still do backstage and have done for 23 years because I don't hope I'm going to be in a good state. I demand it. So I do an incantation using my whole body. I'd say, I now command my subconscious mind to direct me in helping as many people as possible in life today to better their lives by giving me the strength, the emotion, the persuasion, the humor, the brevity, whatever it takes to show these people and get these people to change their lives now. And I would do that literally driving in my Volkswagen to a meeting in LA on the freeway for 40 minutes. People are looking at me, I'm screaming at the top of my lungs. They're going, I know he's a serial killer. I know he is. But by the time I entered that room, when two people meet, if there's rapport, the person who's most certain will always influence the other person. And I was totally certain, and they were trying to get revved up to certainty. Do you agree with this, yes or no? I do another one, because I was poor, I changed my mindset. I kept doing things, but I never got beyond it. I'd say God's wealth is circulating in my life. His wealth flows to me in avalanches of abundance. All my needs, desires, and goals are met instantaneously by infinite intelligence. For I'm one with God and God is everything. And I would imagine the abundance of my life and I would feel so grateful. And a year later I went from making $38,000 a year to making a million dollars a year in one year. Leverage is critical. You know how I get so much done? Because I don't just get it done. I know the outcome, I know the purpose, and I look for leverage. Leverage is different than delegation. What's the problem with delegation? Delegation is you have all that needs to be done, so you give it to someone else, and you tell them what needs to be done, and when they don't do it, you're pissed off. Leverage says, I can move the biggest boulder in the world with a little bit of effort if I get something I can do it with, but I'm still part of it. So leverage is, if I'm going to leverage something here with Tom, I'm going to make sure Tom understands the what? The outcome. I want to make sure Tom understands the... The purpose, the why, and the action, but I might say to Tom, if you can get this done without this action or better action, go for it, baby. And I want to talk to you on this date, and we got a promise, and we're going to check in before it's needed. So there's no surprises. And if you're having problems, Tom, come back to me, because we're partners on this. That I call leverage. And you know what I do when I have no time? There is time. I just got to leverage it. And I'm saying, you say, I have no one to leverage it to. You know, Shane over here, right? I got all the stuff he wants to do. He can't leverage it. But Shane's answer was, Hire somebody, then he thinks about what it's going to take and goes, $125,000, I can't do that now. He's getting caught up in one way to get the outcome. Leverage. He goes through his list and goes, what if I got somebody to do 20% of this stuff? I, got, I could spend 20 grand to get that much freedom. I could pay for it times 10. Hmm. And if I'm really productive, my productivity should enhance the world, not only my clients and customers, but it should provide jobs for other people. And if there's anything you hate to do, it's because you're either ineffective at it or you don't think it's very important, but it is urgent. So you need to hire somebody for those things. And ideally, somebody who loves that job. You're never going to grow when your time is eaten up for activities that aren't that important. Activity without high levels of purpose is the drain of your fortune. Do it now. If you can't get it all now, do a part of it now. Leverage is power. Leverage is ultimate power. Whenever people fail to achieve their goals 99.9% .9 of the time, and you ask them why, they'll tell you it's because of a lack of resources. That's what all these things are. I didn't have the support, right? I didn't have the money. We didn't have the time. We didn't have this. We didn't have that. There's a resource that people believe is missing. And that resource, belief structure, then keeps people from ever being able to really lead. Because what leaders do is they find a way to maximize whatever resources they have, as little as they may be, and they don't believe in limited resources. I'll give you an example. Let's take a business example to start with. In 1974, a guy named Sam Walton had built his little company up. He came up with an idea. He started with $20,000 in, I think, 1962, if I remember right. But by 1974, within 12 years, he had 78 stores. And you know how he did it? In the middle of the night, he'd drive across the border and he'd go and study other people's stores. He'd buy everything the cheapest he could in the middle of the night. He'd go to other people's stores. Whatever was working, he figured out success leaves clues. He came back and did it in his store. Whatever was working in any store, in any competitor, anywhere he could do it, he did it. So he figured out how to maximize the little resources he had. His 20,000, built 78 stores, and if you read any of the people following him, the company had gone public in that year, they were all saying, this is it. He's maximized his resources. I mean, he only has so much money. There's only so many cities that are going to appeal to this discounting mentality, right? This is it. This is all he can do. 
And the word on Wall Street was sell. Now what's interesting is at that time you look at Sears and Kmart and they were gargantuan companies, weren't they? 20, 30, 40, 50 times, 100 times his size or more probably. And at that time they were the leaders and they knew what's going to happen. But did things change, yes or no? Did he suddenly get mass amounts of capital? No. Here's what they didn't understand. Sam Walton now, or the Walton organization, Walmart, is the most successful retailing operation on earth. And when you talk about Bill Gates being the richest man in the world, that's only true because Sam's fortune is divided up amongst a bunch of different family members. You put them together, they dwarf Bill Gates. Sam Walton did this. How did he do it? What people underestimated is that this guy could go to 4,400 stores, do 250 billion. Where's Kmart today? And they've been shrinking. All of them have been shrinking. And he's the dominant force on earth. Here's the thing he understood. Resources are interesting, but the ultimate resources are the feelings of emotion that make you resourceful. Think of it this way. Resourcefulness is the ultimate resource. What do I mean? What are the emotions that make all this possible? What's the fuel that takes an idea from being in your head where you intellectually know what to do? How many have had an idea, for example, was a great idea, you're excited about it, and then you didn't do anything, one day there you saw it on the shelf, you saw it somewhere, someone stole your idea. How many have had this happen? Say I. <laughs> the only difference between you and that person was not that they had more resources, they were more resourceful. Success and failure are not giant events. They don't just show up. You don't just suddenly become successful or suddenly have this cataclysmic event that makes you fail. It may look that way, but failure comes from all the little things. It's failure to make the call. It's failure to check the books. It's failure to say, I'm sorry. It's failure to push yourself to do things physically that you don't want to do. And all those little failures day after day come together until one day some cataclysmic event happens and you blame that. That event happened because you missed all the little stuff. Do you agree with me? And success, by the way, is not some overnight event. It's all these little things. Success is having a vision. Success is making it compelling. Success is really seeing it and feeling it every day with strong enough reasons. Success is feeling the sense that I'm here to grow and I'm here to give something to the world more than just myself. All the little stuff. That's where success comes from. In business, it comes from delivering more than anybody could imagine. All those little things add up. People go, wow, that's who I want to do business with. It's true in any area of your life. Everyone has different goals and dreams and desires, but as I traveled around the world to 100 countries, I started going, holy shit, I'm seeing the same problems. What's underneath it? I began to see that there are these same six human needs that we all have, the same needs. We all have a need for certainty, that we can avoid pain and we can have some pleasure, some comfort. We all need uncertainty. Mm -hmm. We need variety or we feel dead inside. If you're totally certain you're bored, if you have total variety, you're like freak out. And it's not a balance, it's learning which of these you need more as a person. Everyone's developed a different set of values in that area. Um, need of, the need for significance, to feel unique, special, important, the need to feel loved, the need to grow, and the need to contribute. Some people value certainty at the top of their list. That's their center of their target. I don't wanna do anything unless I know it's gonna work. I don't wanna do anything unless it's the same. If you change anything, they freak out. If certainty is the number one thing on your list, everyone has the same needs, but if it's number one, I know how your life's gonna be. I can predict the direction of your life and therefore right. the destination to some extent. If you're driven by love first, you want certainty too, but love is higher, you're gonna behave very differently than if you're driven by significance. I have to be the one. Your experience in business was trying to be significant by making enough money and being successful enough that you would feel what you really want, which is that feeling of love, what you call, uh, uh, not what would you call it? Camaraderie. Camaraderie, thank you, camaraderie. So that feeling of, it's really love, it's, a, it's the friendship, it's the camaraderie, it's that component, that's what really drives you. Sure. And so you figure out how to organize your life where that's the driving force, and now look what you've done. You've flourished and everyone around you is flourishing. So I look to see which of those needs are the top two on your list because they control your life. Yep. The two that most people have, 90% of the planet, if you said, of all these needs, which one do you really focus on most day to day? Everybody wants love, but what do you focus on? Most people focus on being significant. We live in a Facebook world where people fake their life, put new filters, make it look different than it really is, tell stories that you know are totally full of it to make themselves look good. Because we live in this kind of false world where significance is more important than love. Right. And it separates us. 
And the other one that we see most often is certainty. People want to be certain before they can do something. You couldn't have started a business like you had if you were absolutely certain before you started. You can never build a business with that. You can never build a great relationship because if it's based on certainty, then everybody's got to stay the same and never change, which means you're never going to grow, which means you're going to be miserable. Right. So my metrics are, I want to find out what's driving you. And I want to see, is it healthy or unhealthy? You can have two people be driven by significance, though, and do it with a different set of rules. That's the second piece I measured. The beliefs or rules of how to fulfill that target. So Osama bin Laden, certainty driven, love driven, contribution driven, <laughs> significance driven, not hard to figure out. <laughs> On a zero to 10, he was a 10 for significance. He was the, whatever, I'm making the number up, I think he was like the 27th child of his father, 22nd child. Whoa. Most people don't know that. Totally insignificant, not skilled, took his dad's money, went over to Afghanistan and suddenly, because he had money, he became significant. Mm. And he started, he wasn't even part of that movement at that stage. It shaped him. So what does he do? He's gonna figure out, his model of the world is, I'm significant if I destroy you, right? On that same day of 9-11, there were men and women in the fire department, police department, that were also driven by significance and contribution. And they went into that building knowing they're likely gonna die to save a stranger. Both people driven to have a significant life. Mm. One is by taking life, one is by giving their own life. Mm. So once you understand the metrics, using your language, of what's driving you and then the rules or beliefs of what does it take for you to feel loved, it's different for everybody. What does it take for you to feel certain? Some people need a billion dollars, some people just need to trust God. In the early stages of me and myself as an entrepreneur, I started all these companies from scratch. And then I met a gentleman, the gentleman who started MTV, and we had this really cool conversation. He said, you know, Tony, it took me you know, a decade and a half to really build up MTV. And he said, and then I built another company. And he said, Tony, you know what I realized? It takes like seven years, that was his number in his head, on average, to go from scratch to build something that's really stable and strong and so forth. You know, and he goes, I realized there's only so many seven year cycles in my body. And he said, but if I went to a company that already has been around for seven, 10, 20 years, and I bring my ability, my vision, my ability to grow that business, my ability to inspire the people, my ability to produce resourcefulness, then I get a multiplied effect. And he goes, Tony, you're the best in the world at what you do, but damn, you work your tail off. And so he asked me if I'd come speak. He, he, one of the companies he took over was Century 21 Real Estate. Yep. And he said, why haven't you ever spoken for us? I said, because your company asked me over and over, but they're cheap. You know, They want to pay me $100,000 and my fee's a quarter of a million. He goes, oh, he goes, we'll pay the quarter of a million. I said, no, for you, I'll do it for free because he's a friend and I'm learning from him. So I came into the speech and afterwards he sat me back down. And he goes, Tony, there are 10,000 people here. He says, I know like all my financial guys, they, they all look to you, but you're like a rock star from middle America. These people in gold jackets selling real estate. He goes, do you know how much our business increased in those four months? And I don't remember the exact number. It was like 22 or 23% or something. He goes, do you know how much money you made me? And you got nothing. <laughs> he said, let me give you some advice. Go find people that have some form of momentum that you can turn it around and get a piece of that. And that's how I changed. So what I looked for were businesses that I felt tremendous emotional connection to because I felt they'd touch people's lives in some way. And I looked for partners that were geniuses, but where I could bring my own genius to it, where one plus one equals five, or at least three, not two. And by doing that, I got pieces of these different companies, and then it just grew and grew and grew and grew. So I'm in virtual reality. I have a company called NextVR. My partners are geniuses, and we just locked down the exclusive for the NBA. So instead of Monday night football, we have Tuesday night NBA, and you literally, it's like you're on the court, you can look, and it feels like you can reach out and touch LeBron. It's mind-boggling, and there's no cords or computer. It's all done off your phone with an app. It's mind-boggling. Wow. Um, we also have the, the exclusive for Live Nation for all concerts. So you can be right there next to Jay-Z or Beyonce, like you feel like you can touch them, right? I have a company that does number one guy in stem cells in the world. I have a company that does genetics, you know, that's just genius. Um, I've got companies that are in the education space. I bought Adweek with a group of partners. I have my financial companies. So the diversity I have is mind boggling, but that's also the secret to investing. You know, if you got all your eggs in one basket and there's a problem, you need to make sure you run your business really successful, give it your all, not start 20 of them. But once that business really is strong and your investments are strong, then you can build a second one. Most people, they build a business and then it's not going as well as they want, so I start another business because it feels more exciting. And it's like, you have one child you're not taking care of, so let's have a second child and a third child, and it just doesn't work. But 
the diversity of it also makes me excited. So I manage 12 of them actively. The others, I have such great partners. Like, you know, I own, uh, you know, uh, the Major League Soccer new franchise in LA. I'm a partner in that. Uh, it's called the LA Football Club. But my partner is Peter Guber, who owns the LA Dodgers and owns the Golden State Warriors and about as smart a human as you could ever have in the sports field. And then I bought um, uh, in the esports field, you know, it's mind boggling. We fill whole stadiums now with people watching people play video games. So I bought uh, Team Liquid, which with my partners with Peter and everyone else. And, and so, I mean, the opportunities are just amazing because I'm partnering with people who have skills that are the best in the world and I'm bringing mine. I and mean, when you combine them, you know, you get a greater impact. Connection right, and versus significance. I wanna be the best, so I gotta be different, but I wanna be in, in community with you. I wanna be close to you. I want, I want love and I want connection, but see, what most people, like, you see this in, in great actors or, or great uh, entertainers, they'll come to me and in the beginning, they work so hard to be significant, to be unique, to be special, to be important. What they really wanted was love. But now people stop on the street and. They'll say to me, they don't even know who I am. They just want my time, they just want this, they want a picture. They, they don't respect my family, they don't respect it. You'll hear them so upset. What they wanted was the love. But see, we, we can have both. But the more significant I am, the more unique I am, the more separate I am from you. The more connected I am, then some people go, yeah, but where am I? Where am I special? So the finding that balance between the two is what makes people feel alive. And we can meet all these needs in positive ways or negative ways. You can get significance by tearing other people down. Oh, they don't, they're lucky, they, they don't care, they took advantage of somebody, you don't know anything about them. You see people dealt with famous people all the time. <laughs> Why are they tearing them down? Because if I don't feel good about myself, if I can make you smaller, I look like I'm moving up. But you're not, and it doesn't work. But if you do things where you significantly love someone, if you care for someone, you're the most significant person in life. If you try to prove you're significant, then you have kind of the Trump effect. Even people that like him will say, you know, sometimes he can push people aside because he's telling everybody how special he is. I'm not making a political statement. I'm saying that gets in the way of relationship. If we're gonna connect, we gotta not make ourselves significant. We gotta find out what's significant in the other person and honor it. There's so many things, you know, people's relationships are complex, right? Because you're dealing with another species. Even if you're gay, in order to have a, a relationship, you need opposite energies, max male, male and female energies, even if it's in the same gender. And so relationships are a huge source of challenge for people because it's where you get the greatest joy and it's where you get the greatest pain. Um, I think in business, most people get into business, and we all know the stats, 50% of businesses are gone the first year, 96% are gone in 10 years, four out of 100 make it. That doesn't mean they're profitable. So there's different issues that you deal with there. People's bodies, because of the way we have commercialized food, makes almost everybody, what 70% of Americans are overweight. I mean, it's the fast country in the history of the world and the rest of the world's mirroring us. So I deal with so many different issues. It really depends on the person. People come to me, usually at extremes. They're either the best in the world at what they do and they're doing well and they just, they're the best because they're always looking for that little set, that little thing I can do that makes me better, better, better and takes me to a different destiny. Or it's somebody facing a challenge. And, you know, they're facing a financial challenge, a business challenge, an emotional challenge, a relationship, challenge with their kids, or they have a birthday with a zero on it. So they're reevaluating their life. So I, I get people who have found a hunger. They're hungry because it's not how they want it or they're hungry because that's their nature. People are not hungry, I don't really deal with because they pretty much accept where things are. And so, and so what I wish for them, what I pray for them is they find something to inspire them more than themselves or the wagon wheel comes down their rut. <laughs> you know, they get enough pain that they start searching. And I don't care how smart you are, how strong you are, how rich you are, how famous you are, life is gonna humble you. You know, like life's gonna take you to your knees. The real question is what are you gonna do when that happens? And so for me, it's really like what this challenge is about. It's like a comeback challenge. The greatest story again. What is the greatest story of mankind? What's the story we all love in books and movies? It's a comeback. It's somebody who gets taken to their knees, unfairly, unjustly, whatever, or their own ego takes them there. And then instead of giving up, they get up, they get knocked down, they get up, and then eventually they only get up and they don't get to where they were, get them better than they were. So when you have the meaning that this is the beginning of the relationship and this person's the most incredible thing and you will do what for them, what will you do? anything. What if you were that way with your client? What if you're that way with your internal customers because your partners, you go, well, we'd have real sexual problems with HR, that would be the real challenge. <laughs> but if your commitment was the same, when you're in that place, you do anything in the beginning of a relationship, in the beginning of a relationship, if your partner said, would you take out the trash? What do you say? Take out the trash. <laughs> Happily. But after about seven days or seven weeks or seven months or seven years, 
or 70 years, one day someone says, we take out the trash, go, what do I look like, you janitor? You go, what happened to our passion? I'll give you a clue. If you want a relationship to last, if you think it's coming to the end, do what you did in the beginning and there won't be an end. Because when you think it's the beginning, you behave differently than the end. The meaning we associate to things controls our entire life. It's not that your mother or father died that's giving you suffering. Certainly that's painful. It's the meaning you think it shouldn't have happened. And when we take control of the meaning, it's the only thing we can control our lives. We can't control events. When 911 happened, and I'll finish with this, I was in Hawaii. I was with 2,000 people from 45 countries. We were translating four languages simultaneously for a program that I was conducting for a week. The night before was called Emotional Mastery. I got up, had no plan for this, and I said, we had all this fireworks, I do crazy fun stuff. And then at the end I stopped, and I had this plan I was gonna say, but I never do what I'm gonna say. And all of a sudden I said, when do people really start to live when they face death? And then I went through this whole thing about if you were gonna get off this island, if nine days from now you were gonna die, who would you call, what would you say, what would you do? One woman, well that night is when 9-1-1 happened. One woman had come to the seminar and when she came there, she, her previous boyfriend had been kidnapped and murdered. Her friend, or her new boyfriend, wanted to marry her and she said no. He said, if you leave and go to that Hawaii thing, it's over with us. She said, it's over. When I finished that night, she called him and left a message, true story, at the top of the World Trade Center where he worked. Saying, honey, I love you. I just want you to know, I, I want to marry you. It was stupid of me. She was asleep, because it was 3 a.m. for us, when he called her back from the top and said, honey, I can't tell you what this means. He said, I don't know how to tell you this, but you give me the greatest gift, because I'm gonna die. And she played the recording for us in the room. She was on Larry King later. And he said, you're probably wondering how on earth this could happen to you twice. And he said, all I can say to you is, this must be God's message to you, honey, from now on, every day, give your all, love your all. Don't let anything ever stop you. I was in my early 20s, and I developed this incredible arsenal of tools, a toolbox, a tool chest, if you will, of the very best tools to create change rapidly, things that look like magic to people, where I could take somebody and I would go on a radio show or a TV show and I would challenge traditional psychologists and psychiatrists and I'd say, give me your worst patient. I don't care if they have uncontrollable phobias. Have them come see me, I'll handle it in one hour. And I developed this idea that I was the one hour, the one stop coach, the person that could help people make any change. And I built my career by actually doing that. I got on television and radio and I took people with lifetime phobias and turned them around. And these are all just techniques and strategies that I didn't develop. I just kept looking for the best and I kept synthesizing it and bringing it forward. So when I started out, here I was, this guy helping people lose 30, 60, 90, in some cases 200 pounds. Or taking a guy that was barely surviving financially and within a couple of years of this counseling or coaching as I started to call it, really got him to turn his business around and literally got him financially independent. Relationships that were falling apart and I, I learned the distinctions to help couples change. And so when you start getting those types of results that are that measurable, people started giving me attention and the media started to come to me and then what they wanted to know was this, what are you? You know, and I thought, are you a guru? I said, no, 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 I'm not that. You're Mr. Motivator, like no, no, I I'm certainly believe in people having an inspired life. I mean, think about it. Inspiration is pretty important. If you're not inspired, what is inspired? It means in spirit. It means there's an energy in your life. If you're not inspired about your life, what do you have? Nothing. But I'm really more about strategy. And they kept pushing me. Guru, motivator, what are you? you know? and, I, and I said, well, you know what I really am? I'm a coach. And I came up with that metaphor. I mean, there's always been consultants in business. I wasn't talking about businesses. It was individuals. And I, I said, I'm not a therapist. You know, I said, and I don't have a degree. People pay me because I produce measurable results. They pay me nothing unless I do it. That's how I set up my career, that's how I built my brand. And I said, you know, for me, coaches are people that are not better than you are. A coach just has a different perspective. I mean, even back in those days, the best athletes in the days, the Gretzkys, the Michael Jordans, et cetera, they all had a coach. Still to this day, the best have coaches because the coach can see what you can't see because you're in the force, they're outside of it. And I know as an athlete, I was better than some of my coaches, but they made me better. So I said, that's my job, I'm a coach. Because to me, a coach is not better, they're, they're a friend, they're, they're an equal, they're there for you. There's somebody who cares deeply about your well-being, but they're also incredibly skilled to help guide you at the moment you really need it. And so I started promoting this idea of being a coach and you know, the sports metaphor helped some people, but the media didn't buy into it very much. But I was able to succeed 
finally, because I was able to keep measuring these results. I mean, I would go out and say, I'll come see me for one session, I'll handle this problem or you pay me nothing. And you can check it out for 60 days. I still use that formula to this day, as many of you know, with my products and services. So what was really fascinating, though, was along the way, I was, there was a point after years of calling myself a coach, and there was no coaching industry, nobody talked to themselves as coaches. I remember at one point, I hit a point where I was about to give it up. And Larry King even said to me on, on air one time, he said, you know, what is this? You're, you're a coach. What does that mean? And I was trying to explain peak performance coaching and strategy and so forth. And, and right about that time, suddenly coaching became the term of art. And everybody was a coach. Therapists started calling themselves coaches. You know, uh, Financial planners became coaches. It just became the term of art. So it's been a fascinating journey watching that word come in because what I did is I helped build that term by making it based on real results. I remember turning 40 and I was really, really unhappy. I was like, Jesus, I've not done enough. I've not helped enough people. I know tens of millions of people at that point already had done all over the earth in a hundred plus countries at that point, but it was still kind of stuck in my head. So I would earn the love by over delivering, change somebody's life. Like, I don't get it because somebody says, oh, I love you, Tony. I mean, I appreciate that. Or, oh, you're the greatest. It's gotta be my standard. My standard's higher than their standard for me, right? So when I get up and someone's gonna kill themselves and it's they're suicidal and boom, turn around, they're no longer not gonna kill themselves, but they're transformed, their life is there. You know, that's when I go, okay, you know, now we've hit the center of what I'm made for. Now, you know, I deserve to feel this euphoric feeling within myself and appreciation. And even then, I still know it's God coming through me. I don't have the delusion, it's just me. But I think sometime after 40, I finally saw the stupidity of it. I accumulated enough that I looked at life with fresh eyes. And I can say by the time I turned 60 a year ago, I noticed it was interesting because my birthday, I didn't have an ounce of it. I was just like, you know, how could I at this stage of my life when I've had the privilege of serving so many humans in so many contexts, you know, from turning around, you know, guys are gonna kill themselves with PTSD to helping kids turn around to getting kids off cocaine or adults to, you know, help people build multi-billion dollar businesses from nothing. And when I've lived this long, I can't go by without hearing half a dozen stories a day or a dozen stories a day from people telling me how something I did changed their life. So it's not that I'm so smart now, it's just I've stacked it. By the way, though, stacking is the way you can do things. Most of us stack the negative. If you mm. are really angry, it's not usually because it's just the moment. It's that it happened again. You know, it's like if you've ever lost it or overreacted to your kid or to a friend or a business or even within yourself, it's because it happened again. We hit this one, two, three, many point and then our nervous system overreacts. But what I've learned is you can stack the good. And but for example, if you're if you go into a state of really strong anger for more than five minutes, your immune system is suppressed between an hour and a half to two hours. That's a physiological fact. But no one had done any study, I started stacking good. Like, okay, let me stack a dozen great memories. Feel them, see them, experience them. And I felt this biochemical change that didn't just last a half hour, an hour, or 10 minutes. It went on for a day or two. And so I think uh, I've learned to stack the good. So just having the experience is not enough. You gotta stack the good to be able to appreciate it. But I, I think, just come back to the main point here from my perspective, which could be completely full it's just my perspective. So I wanna point that out. I think the more you find unconditional love for others, the easier it is to find in yourself. And I think the focus is serving and loving, and that's what will get you to the point where you start doing it. But if you want to speed it up, stack all the good you've done, you'll feel great about yourself. Fundamentally, the most basic thing you got to do, especially at a time like COVID, is you got to every day have a couple of simple practices. One of those is every day you got to feed your mind. And when I say feed your mind, I mean consciously seek out something that's going to give you new insight, new inspiration, new way of looking at things. Because otherwise, today the news follows you, right? It's in your pocket. And the news, people are good people. But they're doing their job. What's their job? Make as much profit as possible. How do you get the most profit? Get the most people to watch. How do you get the most people to watch? Fear. If it, you know, if it, if it bleeds, it leads is the phrase they use in journalism, right? And we've seen so much fear built up now that most people have lost their faith. And you can't lose it, fortunately. It's just a muscle that needs to be regained. But you have to fill your mind. You have to pursue it. Great ideas are not going to interrupt you. They have to be pursued. And the good news is today, if you get away from just the traditional news, you can do go to podcasts like Boss Babes. You can go to different locations. You can get another perspective. And you can feed your mind. But if you don't feed your mind, my original teacher was a guy named Jim Rohn. And he used to say, Tony, I got a question for you. He said, what if 
your worst enemy puts sugar in your coffee, what's going to happen to you when you drink that coffee? Is it going to have sweet coffee? He said, you know, what if your family member, your friend, your love by accident drops one drop of strychnine? What's going to happen when you drink that coffee? He said, you're going to be dead. And he goes, that's right. Life is sugar and strychnine, so watch your coffee. <laughs> like every day, you got to stand guard at the door of your mind, especially at times like this when there's so much fear. So you feed your mind. No matter how long you live, no matter what changes in society, skill number one, yeah. it's the ability to recognize patterns. You're really good at it. You do it in finance. You do it in business. Thank you. I'm not just blowing you with smoke. Thank That's you. why you're successful. Because when you recognize patterns, it allows you to go to the second step, which is use them. Mm. If you recognize financial patterns, you can do great things. You recognize patterns in business, you can turn around any business. You know, mm. that's what I've been doing. For, I have 105 companies now. We do $7 billion in business. And I have no business background. But I recognize the patterns and I studied the billionaires that started with nothing and said, what did they do? How did they do it? How did they turn it around? Mm. So if you can recognize patterns and if you can use them, you got a great advantage. But then gradually over time, like, you know, if you go to play the piano, you usually play other people's music initially. Mm. And then there's a point where you come through. Now you start creating patterns. And when you start creating patterns, that's when you become mm. a dominant force in business and life and the marketplace and with your children or anywhere else. Momentum is everything, right? Mm -hmm. The hardest part in life is creating momentum. So when that all happened, you know, I had built something of momentum over, you know, 40 years, literally at that point yeah. around the world. And, you know, what do you do all of a sudden when, you know, suddenly they say you can't do an event with more than 10 people and you've got 15,000 people scheduled to take over the stadium. <laughs> and, you know, you know what I did? I went, we're going to Vegas. They're never going to shut down Vegas, right? <laughs> but then they shut down Vegas. I was like, I know I'm going to rent a church, a mega church from a buddy of mine in Houston, mm -hmm. 15,000 people. They're not going to keep Costco open and shut down the church. They kept Costco open and shut down the church. Mm -hmm. So I got to the point where it's like, what do you do? And when you think there's nothing you can do, that's when you can do something. When you think, I don't know what to do, that's when you know what to do if you just push yourself. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, I pulled my team together. I saw a guy do like a webinar with two 52 inch screens. And I said, I'll kill myself first. I said, I got to create an experience for people. They need it desperately wherever they are in the world. So mm -hmm. literally I pulled out a tape recorder. It's like, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to do 20 foot high LED screens, 50 feet wide, <laughs> highest resolution in the world, 0. 0.67, 150, you know, 50 degrees, 180 degrees around me and around the back. I'm going to call my buddy, Eric Yawn, and I'm going to see if Zoom, we can expand him from the little thousand to 20,000 or 30,000. I'm going to hire a firm to create an app so they can shake it so it sends a signal and you can hear reality of people clapping because the more shake it, the louder it gets. And I, I just started creating the whole thing in an hour there. So when I was done, my, my CFO says, uh, Tony, um, you know, after he saw all the numbers, yeah. you know, it was over 20 million bucks by the time we're done. He's like, Tony, uh, should we rent some of this first? <laughs> and I said to him, I said, listen, of all, first of all, you can't. I said, go do your best. Not what I'm looking for. I said, second of all, this is going to be this way for a while. Yeah. And we're going to use this to help more people. And that, you know, when things go back to normal, we get to go do that too. Mm -hmm. And I just did a date with Destiny where I had, you know, uh, 10,000 people from 97 countries. And then I had 500 people in front of me because I built the studio so that there's 40 foot high ceilings. So I could literally lift the 20 foot screen. And so now I have a hybrid event. People don't want to come personally on there. People that want to be in the middle of the night in some other country are able to participate. Mm. But all that comes from just taking action and momentum. Yeah. If you build momentum, you can accomplish anything. You've seen it in sports. You see a team that's dominating and then somebody steals the ball and the momentum changes. Yeah. Your job right now is to create momentum. And, that, and that's why I'm building this challenge is basically to say to you, let's do a breakthrough for you right now so you know it's real. Let's get you to get a real result. Let's get you to shift yourself physically and mentally and emotionally so you can build that momentum because it takes so much energy to rock it out of the atmosphere. It takes very little to take it out of the solar system. So that momentum, I think, is critical. Just to entrepreneurs in general, uh, and you're an entrepreneur, wildly successful entrepreneur, and uh, you work with and are friends with many, many of the top entrepreneurs in the world. What are a few of the common attributes of the super successful entrepreneurs that you've seen? There might not be the obvious ones that yeah. you know come to mind. Well, gosh, uh, you know, uh, I give you one example because I was just talking to him yesterday. Mark Benioff's a dear friend of mine, and he runs a company called Salesforce.com. He founded it. Mark went to my Unleash the Power Within event about 15 years ago. He went to it three times. You know, it's, you know, it's repetitions, the mother skill. He immersed himself in it. Again, a pro, not going to do something average. Comes up to me and introduces himself and says, Tony, he said, I'm, you've changed my life. I'm working for Oracle. I'm leaving. I'm starting this company, Salesforce.com. We're going to change the business world. I never guess. We're going to do $100 million in business. I was teasing the other night. He's going to do $7 billion this year, right? And I've been on that 15-year journey with him. 
you know, what, what do they have in common? They have a sense of something they want to serve greater than themselves. You know, the only challenge sometimes in network marketing, and I think what gives it a bad reputation for some people, is you get people in there that really act like they're doing it for something larger than themselves, but it really is only them. Now, there's nothing wrong with you wanting to profit and be successful, but motive does matter. And the most successful entrepreneurs have a motive that includes themselves, but they want to do something that's going to change the world, make the world different. It's like, you know, when you're trying to meet your own needs, you get a certain level of insight. If you're trying to meet the needs of a fam your family, you, you get a different level of insight because life supports whatever supports more of life, more people. If you're trying to support your community, you different insight. If you're trying to you know, have an impact on the world, it's even larger. And I found in network marketing, you find a few missionaries that are like those other entrepreneurs that really is their mission. They'd honestly do it for free. And you know they want to make money and they do make money, but if you're only doing it for the money, the unfortunate part is, um, people sense that and then they feel like it's just a transaction as opposed to an experience of added value. So only one way on earth to really become wealthy and that is do more for others than anybody else is doing. You mentioned you reach out to someone, you'll text someone, you'll send a voice note or a video message uh, or maybe you're calling them or just saying hi to them and telling them you're acknowledging something that they're doing well that you appreciate. I don't think that many people do this. Why is this so important for you personally, and why do you think this would help so many people get out of themselves and overcome anxiety and stress if they did this even a couple of times a week? I know you do this every day, but just a couple texts a week, why was this so valuable for people? I, well, number one, I love people, so I love to sincere. If you just call, call someone to make a compliment and it's not sincere, anybody can feel that. I don't do that shit, you know? It's like I, I pride myself in finding the goodness in people or the skill sets in people and I also know that what is acknowledged tends to grow. So from standpoint of that, I, I want them to feel that feeling of being appreciated. I want them to know I see what's happening behind the camera, so to speak. You know, it's like, uh, that's what matters. It's not how everybody else sees you, it's how you really are. And then it also deepens every relationship you have when you sincerely acknowledge somebody and you notice something other people don't notice. And so it, it deepens the connection. And to me, quality of life is the quality of two things, your emotions and your relationships. And you know, if my emotions are terrible, my relationships are gonna be terrible. Right. But if <laughs> right. I have great emotions and I can extend that out to help other people, then it just makes me feel more alive. So I, I do it for me and them, it's, it's a virtuous cycle. Where focus goes, energy flows. Well, Most people are focused on what they're afraid of and so more fear comes their way. And it's easy because we all have a two million year old brain that's designed to look for what's wrong to protect. So we protect ourselves to fight it or to run for it or to freeze, right? That's the way our old brain is wired. It's a two million year old brain, but that brain's never gonna make you happy. You have to learn to take control of your focus. And if you focus on, oh my God, it's never gonna work. Or you listen to somebody who tells you, oh, the, you know, COVID's gonna be here forever. and We're never gonna have any freedom again. And you focus on that, you can get really depressed as most people have. We've had. 100,000 people overdose on drugs. We have more depression and more people in a suicidal mode than we've ever seen in the last two years because people need a compelling future. You can deal with a tough today if you got a compelling tomorrow. And so what I help people do is design that. But once you change your focus, you'll change how you feel. Focus and feeling go together. If you want another amazing Tony Robbins video, check it out right there next to me. I think you'll love it. Continue to believe and I'll see you there. I was really frustrated because I love what I do for a living. It's emotional rewards are gigantic, mm. but it's not a it's not a, a business that has a great deal of you know opportunity for maximizing profit.